So hello, Michael. Hello. Uh, it's such a pleasure to have you and discuss uh, success today because you are a super coach and uh, you teach people how to tap into their genius and geniuses and, and how we, I mean, you have written many books and uh, I wanted to hear what was your definition on, of success and how you see success. Well, uh, for, me, for me, success, it really is a balance between the inside and the outside. So it's not about just having stuff for achievement and it's not just about being happy and content, but it is about the marriage between those two. And I'll often talk about happy success because that's what people really want. People, people think they've got to choose, but what they really want is both. They want to be happy and successful. They want to feel great and they want to drive a nice car. They, they, they want to have a wonderful spiritual experience of themselves and, and, and connection with others and they want to live in a beautiful home. The idea that you've got to choose between those two, or that if you get enough of the money and the success, you're automatically going to get the other, that doesn't work. And, and my experience has been, in the 20 years I've been doing this, that it does work very well the other way. That when you start with discovering where your happiness really comes from, and it's not outside you, from finding the source of your well-being, it's actually quite easy to then go out and create what you want in the world. Mm -hmm. So where do we start from then? What's the first step? What do we first need to identify? Well, the first thing that you probably need to begin to, to see is where does your experience of life come from? Because we live in a world that tells us that our experience of life comes from the outside in. That what happens outside of us creates our experience on the inside. So if good things, which means things we like, happen on the outside, then we'll have a good experience. But if bad things happen, then we'll have a bad experience. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take much looking to see that that's not true. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes something not great is happening, but we're having a wonderful time. And sometimes something great is happening and we're miserable. And so when you look deeper, you start to see that your experience of life is actually being created by three things. We call them the three principles. And, and the first is thought that the world is what we think it is. And this is the book Supercoach is built around a deeper understanding of this one principle. And so whatever we look for, we tend to see. And our world becomes our thinking. Hamlet said, you know, there's nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. The Buddha talked about all that you are is the result of all that you have thought. It goes through every sort of bit of philosophy and teaching from the beginning of time. We don't really believe that, though. We, we, we nod and we go, oh, yes, 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 it's thought. I understand it's thought. But that's not. And we find the exception. We go, yeah, yeah, but money is real. Oh, yeah, yeah, but my husband is real. Oh, yeah, yeah, but my boss is real. And we don't get It's actually physically not possible to really experience your boss or your, your spouse or, or your money. Only your thoughts about them. So when you begin to understand that what you're actually experiencing is your own thinking, then you start to notice, gee, what I'm feeling is my thinking. So if I'm feeling bad, it's because I'm having a bad thought. If I'm feeling scared, it's because I'm having a scary thought. If I'm feeling angry, it's because I'm having an angry thought. And suddenly the whole thing about I need to change the world to change how I feel makes less and less sense. It would be like being at the movie theater and you know, you're in the movie and, and you don't like what's on the screen, so you run up to the screen and start shouting at the screen and going, hey, don't do that, change it. It's not going to work, it's just not how it's designed. So when you understand the principle of thought, then you understand somehow there's something else that enables us to experience what we think, and that's consciousness. We call it the principle of consciousness. And consciousness is just your capacity to experience. And I think of it sometimes like a big container. Like I'm carrying around a big container, and whatever I'm thinking about, that's what's inside my consciousness. So I can fill my consciousness with crap, I can fill my consciousness with fear thoughts, I can fill it with sad thoughts, and then I'll feel sad, I can fill it with scary thoughts and I'll feel scared, I can fill it with God and I'll feel all godly. Whatever my consciousness is filled with, that's what I'm going to experience. So just let me just pause one second, why do you separate consciousness with the thought then, if the, con if the thoughts are put into the consciousness? Why do you because separate those two? It's actually a great point because if it was just thought, then every thought would have the same impact. So 
the reality is there's a lot of things, thoughts that go through your head that you don't really pay any attention to. And they don't really have much impact on your life. So it's the thoughts that fill your consciousness. It's the thoughts you dwell on. Okay. It's the thoughts that seem important to you that create your life. Otherwise, it would be like if I take a tea bag, like what kind of tea don't you like? What's your least favorite kind of tea? Nettle. Nettle. So if I take a bag of nettle tea and I put it in a mug and give it to you, it's not really going to have any impact on your life until I pour the hot water on it. So consciousness is like the hot water being poured on the thought. It's what brings it to life. It okay. infuses. So how, how do we put in the thought into consciousness then? Well, it happens all the time. It's just the nature of it. But some of them don't enter there. That's well, what you're saying. Like enter, it's that they pass out so quickly, it's like they have no impact. So how so do we like, make the good ones stick? That's my question. Oh, well, that's actually kind of easy. It's by just letting the bad ones go. Right. And this is where the third principle comes in, is if it was an even playing field, then it would be very important that we grab the good thoughts and try and get rid of the bad thoughts and play the positive thinking game. But there's this third principle. There's this force that we call mind in the work that I do, but you could call it spirit, you could call it life force, but it's the energy and intelligence behind life. It's, 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 what, it's the reason an acorn has never hired me as a life coach, because I don't know what's happening. All my friends are becoming oak trees. I'm just struggling. It's inside it. It's innate. There is an innate drive towards growth within everything in life. There's an innate movement towards health. If I cut my knee, I don't have to heal it. It wants to heal itself. Mm -hmm. I better. It's that drive towards health is inside us all. So we've got thought and consciousness, but we've also got this power of mind. And if we just don't dwell on the crap, it'll always be replaced by a higher thought, by a better thought, by a deeper thought. And and the way we experience it then is with a deeper feeling. And that extraordinary feeling of well-being that we all strive for, of peace, of ah, that's actually our nature. That is what our consciousness is filled with before we fill it up with all the crap. So how, would, how can we anchor those? How can we really make them stick? Well, it, it's funny. You don't have to make it stick because it's what's there anyways. Nah. What you have to do is stop pulling it away. Stop mucking with it. I've got a friend who uses a metaphor of a snow globe. And you shake up the snow globe and there's all this stuff going on and there's, oh my God, and that, and i got to deal with that, and that, and that. But if you just wait, it settles and you return to clear. You return to well-being. You return to your real nature. And that's what people miss is, you know, I'll sometimes do something with clients where I'll just say, take a minute. Take one minute just to be. And if they actually do it, and they'll fight it like crazy, yeah, but we've got to talk about this, we've got to figure out this. Things are different at the end of that minute. And it's because they've, the dust has settled a little bit, the snow has settled. They're a little bit closer to their true nature of clear consciousness, mind just bringing in the good, and, and you know, deeper, higher thoughts coming in. So what do you say for people that are into the panic zone and, and, and really afraid? How, how do you recenter yourself? How do you just be when there's just so, so much going on? Well, a lot of it, I got an email um, two days ago from a woman who in Australia, and she was asking almost that question. She said, we've had all these earthquakes, we've had all these aftershocks, and we love your, we listen to your radio show, we've read your books, but we're scared! And, and what I wrote her is, is, is first off, I'm sorry, because life is a contact sport. Things happen. You know, there, there is no, um, there's no path through life other than wrapping yourself in cotton wool and locking yourself away where things won't happen to you. But what's scaring you isn't what's happening. What's scaring you is your thinking. Mm -hmm. It's your thinking about what it means, about how things will be different now, they'll be harder, what if this happens? What if I lose this person? What if I get hurt? It's all those thoughts, and especially when they're frenzied, that's what creates the fear. And if you can see that, you don't have to do anything because it will naturally just settle. 
it, it would be like um, a woman actually called the radio show once and she said, um, oh my God, I need you to help me with this, and I need you to help me with that, and I need you to help me with this, and I need you to help me with that. And I said, I said to her, if I gave you a bowl of water filled with murk, like all on, and, and asked you to clear it, how would you do it? She said, well, I boil it. She was doing head. She was, oh my God, I'm ruminating on this, and I've got to think about this, and I've got to worry about that. And it just keeps stirring it up. Mm-hmm. If you see that that's what's happening, you'll wait. And it will sell. Mm-hmm. You'll return to clear. You'll return to peace. You'll return to well-being. Once you're there, you may realize I need to get out of this house because it's not safe. But that's effective action. We we confuse fear and worry with effective action. Fear doesn't keep you safe. Effective action keeps you safe. Worry doesn't keep you safe. Knowledge keeps you safe. And. As people get clearer about the difference between those things, they naturally make better choices. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And they're more patient, and then life present things too that are more uh, that 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 could be solutions to those problems. Sure. I mean, I, I get people all the time who come with what they think of as a dilemma, and they'll ask me to help them make a decision. Mm-hmm. And the decision is often between two things they think are horrible. So I, I, had a, I had a doctor phone and say, I, I, want, I want you to help me decide whether to leave the hospital and all these people that I've been working with, and, 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 and which I don't really want to do, but it feels like I, my only other choice is to stay and be exhausted and run down and not really help people as much as I'd like to. Now, if I'd believed that that was the real choice, I would have helped her make it. But I could see that that was just one way of seeing things. And that I knew that if she made space for it in her consciousness, if she allowed those thoughts to move on, that she would see it differently. I didn't know how she'd see it, but I knew she'd see it differently because there's always another way of seeing it. And sure enough, as we talked, as she settled down, as her mind emptied, wisdom came in, a deeper thought. And she suddenly went, oh, I could do this, and I could change things here. And I could change this, and I could. Change. And by the end, she, she it was no longer do I do this or do I do that. It's just when can I start? Because she could see exactly what there was to do. You can only do what you see, and and you can't see if you're looking in the wrong direction. And if you're looking yeah. all the noise, you can't see what's beyond it. So, what do you think is the biggest problem right now that we're all facing? I think the biggest problem that we're all facing is that we are holding a kaleidoscope to to our face, looking through the kaleidoscope and thinking, oh, this is terrible. Let me change the way I see it. Oh, 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 yeah, if I hold the kaleidoscope like this, it looks really good. As opposed to opening our other eye and going, oh, I'm just looking at a mirror with stuff in it. And if I start looking around and seeing that's not real, that's just the reflection of my own thinking, then I can open up the space for my consciousness to get bigger, mm-hmm. to read, to, to see things from a higher level of consciousness. And then it becomes obvious what to do because we innately care about one another. Without all the thoughts about why I shouldn't like you because you talk the way you talk and I talk the way I talk, or you look the way I, you look and I look the way I look, or you're from where you're from and I'm from where I'm from, without the contamination of that thought, we're naturally connected. We don't have to learn to connect. We just have to stop putting all this stuff in between us. And the fact is, I don't, I don't kill my brother. I don't kill my sister. I don't, I don't do harm when I'm not hurting. It's only when I'm confused and I'm hurting that I strike out. And, and that's, I think, our biggest problem is we think it's you. And you think it's me. And in fact, it's just the thoughts. It's just the thoughts that we have, I have in my head and you have in yours. Mm -hmm. So it's time to retrain ourselves, huh? You know what? Funnily enough, I don't believe it is about retraining. Because retraining implies that it's not innate. Like, I have to train myself to be good at a sport or to be good at at speed reading, to be good at sex. I have to train myself to breathe. It's what my body knows to do when I get out of the way. 
I, I don't train myself to uh, feel love when I look at a puppy. It's just what happens. I don't have to, to train myself to, if, if my little girl falls down, to pick her up. That's natural. It's actually getting the others, it's seeing. It really is seeing. Once you see where your experience is coming from, all that other stuff just falls away. And people talk about it. My, my clients for 20 years now have talked about, oh, God, it's completely different. My life is still crap in terms of what's going on out there, but I'm fine. And now that I'm fine, I know what to do about the crap. And I can fix it. And I can make it better. And I can create something wonderful from it. How do you see money? Um, it's easier than carrying around chickens. <laughs> really, it's, that's, that's, it used to be that if I wanted, you know, if I had chickens and you had bricks and I wanted to build a house, I'd bring you some of my chickens and you'd give me some of your bricks. And it's just, we've simplified it. We've invented mm -hmm. called money. And so I take mine and, and uh, you know, instead of carrying my chickens around, I sell my chickens for money. And instead of you carrying your bricks around, you sell your bricks for money. And if I want bricks, I give you money. And if you want chickens, you give me money. That's actually it. And yet, we live in a culture that has either made money into a god and said, oh my gosh, it's life. It's oxygen. Or has gone, ooh, it's darkness. It's awful. It's nothing. And, and my experience is most people either make way too much of it or way too little of it. Because it's very difficult to function without it, but it's not life or death. I mean, for me, money is like paint, right? If I want to paint a room, it's very useful. If I don't want to paint a room, I don't need it. If I've got a lot of paint in the shed and I want to paint the room, great, I go to the shed. If I'm running low on paint, I go get it. Money is exactly the same, except we think it's magical. It's hard to get. There are some people who have it and some people who don't. It's good. It's bad. It's evil. It's great. No, it's not. It's paint. It's, it's wood for the stove. You know, when I, we, we uh, spent time up in Vermont as kids, and there was a wood-burning stove. And if my mom came to my dad and said, hey, honey, you know, we're low on wood, he might grumble a little bit, but he'd get up and he'd go out and he'd get more wood either from the back or he'd chop some, or even if he had to, he'd go out into town and get some. And he'd usually get a little more than we needed so that he wouldn't have to get up again the next time. And said, honey, I just checked the bank account. We're almost out. There would have been panic. There would have been chaos. There would have been, oh, what's wrong? What do I do? Well, you go out and get more. Because we think of it as this thing that we forget that all we have to do is create value and then we trade the value for money. And most of us actually, if we really look at it, could get very good at serving and at creating and adding value. It takes. Money is the what we get in exchange for the difference we make in someone else's life. If I make a big difference, you'll give me lots of money. If I make a little difference, you won't give me much. If I make a difference to millions of people, I'll have a lot of money. If I make a difference to four people, I'll have less money. And it, you, which I, I, I share on courses, the value formula, that actually it shows you take any job and plug it in and you'll see the amount of money you can make in that job corresponds directly to the amount of difference you're making, the number of people you're making it to, and how unique that difference is. Like, how easy would it be for them to have that same difference made by someone else? Well, it, it seems like right now there is, there's a bit of a problem with the connection a little bit some there, but we can hear you pretty pretty well and uh, appreciate the message. But the it seems like a lot of companies are collapsing, some companies that were taking more than giving, and now some new structures and some um, innovation and some people thinking in, in different ways, you know, and bringing new things are, are, are going to be the successful one in the future. It's like cards are being a little bit redistributed now. Well, it's a natural correction. You know, people look at it as, oh my God, awful, it's a sign of the end. It's actually, no, it's what needed to happen because a structure cannot, you know, on a, on a faulty foundation, a structure can't stand up. And so if I'm building my structure on no value add, on no difference made, 
it won't sustain. And what's happening is exactly what needs to happen for it to correct. But that's the that's the macro. People spend way too much time worrying about the macro economy. What about your micro economy, your personal economy? If you continue to add value, if you continue to find new ways to serve, you're never going to have to worry about money. And 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 that is simply true. And if you have trouble, if you think, but I am serving, I am adding value. Well, okay, maybe you do need to look at what are you putting in between you and allowing people to pay you for that. Because sometimes we do have these thoughts about what it would mean if we said, hey, I would like a chicken in exchange for my bread, please. You know, I would like to do a trade instead of you just taking all my stuff. Mm -hmm. Voila. Voila. <laughs> It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much. Thank you for